Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that this seminar is being held on traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people and I pay my respects to their elders both past and present. This seminar is being presented under the auspices of the Genocide Commemorative Committee uh, led by Peter Stephanidis um, together with Bondiki Estia in conjunction with the Greek Orthodox community of Melbourne and Victoria. Dean Galimniou is a genocide activist, author, poet, radio broadcaster and solicitor. As secretary of the Panabirotic Federation, he's an advocate of human rights for the Greek minority in Albania. As a journalist, Dean is popular within the Greek community of Australia, <coughs> pardon me, uh, through his column in the Melbourne Greek newspaper Neos Cosmos, entitled Diatribe, and writes in a number of other publications. He has published seven poetry collections and his essays have appeared in such publications as Etchings and Eolika Gramata. Dean has also translated works of prominent Greek Australian authors from Greek into English and is currently working on an English translation of the short stories of Alexandros Papadiamandis. Prior to commencing tonight's seminar on behalf of the Central Pontian Association of Melbourne and Victoria Bondi we would like to thank Dean for his continuous hard work and assistance in preparing these seminars for the past 18 years since 2000. And we'd also like to thank the sponsor of tonight's seminar, former president of the Pontian Community, Federation of Pontian Associations of Australia, and representative of Bondi Giestia, Mrs. Roma Siakos. Thanks, Dean. Take it away. have no pondium, so I'll try and rough it by doing a bit of this and a bit of that, so forgive me if I'm doing various things at once. I'd also like to mention, um, I'll introduce you to Sliding Doors. This is based on the Gwyneth Paltrow movie, mild-mannered Muslim during the day, wicked pondian Christian at night, ladies and gentlemen. Olga um, Siranido, it's this uh, very brave lady uh, in whose memory tonight's lecture is being presented. Um, she died of cancer in uh, 2016. She is Roma Siakou's daughter, so we remember her. And we also thank uh, Mr. and Mrs. Costas and Vicky Guimaras for their sponsorship also of tonight's event. Which event is inspired by this man? Um, that's thank you for being here. Um, because recently uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan uh, opened the uh, archives of the Ottoman Empire with, in relation to births, deaths and marriages. This was a state secret up until now. And all of a sudden, um, at least two million Turks have found out that they've got Armenian grandmothers. Another 1.5 have found out they've got Assyrian grandmothers and no one's speaking much about how many of them have got Greek grandmothers, but we're assuming it's a lot and possibly that's a state secret as well. And the question is, well, how is it that this so-called Turkish nation has all these other nations contributing to it ethnically, linguistically, religiously? And it brings us to our topic, which is that section of the population in Ottoman times that was hidden, that was what we call crypto-Christian, yeah? Crypto-Christians, people who were outwardly Muslim, but inwardly were Christian, or who were changing between one and the other, depending on the requirements of the time. Yeah? Dean, do we know anything about Erdogan? Some people say that he was of Greek origin, Pontian origin. I think that Erdogan... No, I won't say it. I'll leave it for the end. Yeah. I, an anecdote, but we'll leave it for the end. Um, <laughs> Crypto-Christians have been in Pondos for a long time uh, and have been in other areas of the Ottoman Empire as well. We'll find them in Albania right up until the 19th century. Uh, Greeks in villages like Spatha in northern Epirus that said, send us a priest. If you don't send us a priest, we'll turn Muslim, and they did. Um, there's a village called Lazarates, slap in the middle of all the Greek villages in Albania where the, the population turned Muslim. Some of them uh, remained Christian, but they were a Christian in secret. It happens a lot. The Pondian Christians were the majority in Pondos right up until the 18th century, at which time the Hodjas, the Islamic Hodjas, decided that they needed to Islamize the area and they sent what are referred to as Derebes to do this. 
Um, and there was per periodical persecution of the Christians in the area as well. Um, the early attempts to Islamize the Christian population of Fondos took place in the region of Orfis, uh, which is something that we will uh, look at. We'll return to Orfis in a bit, followed by Surmena uh, and Argyropolis in other regions. Now, in the Ottoman Empire, um, Islamic law allowed for the protection of Christians. They were a sub, they were protected subspecies, if you will. Um, and I say subspecies because, as you know, Christians were second-class citizens. Um, Christian testimony didn't count for as much as what Muslim testimony did. There were clothing and employment restrictions. Um, religious life was curtailed. And significantly, so, yeah, a bunch of Christians being subservient. Obviously, that's not a photo. Um, Christians would have to pay the jizya, which is the poll tax, um, a special tax paid on Christians for the privilege of being Christians. After venine paramithia, this is not a story. Uh, Christians are being forced to pay the jizya in areas which are controlled by ISIS even today, small areas, and they were in Mosul, in Erbil, in Syria, right up until recently. So this is a continuation of those times. Uh, and also, uh, if you're a Christian, though, you are exempt from army service. So on the one hand, there's incentive for Christians to move out of their group and become Muslims because they don't have to pay tax and they can have access to employment connections, uh, wealth and legal protection. On the other hand, because of the requirement for, uh, that you can get out of conscription if you're a Christian because they don't want Christians bearing arms, there's incentive to move out of one or the other community, if you will. So how did these crypto Christians behave? when they were in the closet. There's a bunch of them there. Uh, in public, they embraced Islam. They looked like Muslims. They had Muslim names. They went to the mosque. They took part in all of the Islamic rituals. At the same time, they could be found in places where they would have secret liturgies with undercover priests. Um, and uh, private ga all private gatherings associated with the Orthodox faith. Uh, they had double names. Uh, they had double identities, if you will. And the reason for this secrecy is this, that Islamic law provides that if you apostatize from Islam to another religion, that is punishable by death. And that is not a radical Muslim belief, that is a Muslim belief. And the problem is this, you have a sultan who is also the caliph of Islam. He is the high priest and spiritual head of Islam, and he needs to enforce the Islamic religion because he gets his legitimacy and his power in ruling all the subject people of the, empire, of the empire, and especially the Muslim ones, from the fact that he is the supreme head of Islam, just like the, uh, Her Majesty the Queen is the head of the Church of England. Okay, In which case, if he is seen not to be enforcing these Islamic codes, that's a problem with his power and his legitimacy and his hold over the empire. So yes, during this time, uh, Christians who apostatized could be killed. It didn't happen all the time because the Ottoman Empire was a chaotic place and there was no system, just like modern day Greece. However, it's a tragedy. Um, however, what we find is that it did take place on occasion for that reason. And our Christian Martyrologion is full of martyrs who were killed for that reason. They were Muslims who became Christians, or they were Christians who became Muslim and tried to go back, so bad things happened to them. The crypto Christians formed their own endogamic communities. They only married amongst themselves, they only married other crypto Christians generally, and that's how they kept the whole thing to themselves. Um, and this lasted until February 1856 when there was pressure by the European powers to westernize and certain uh, reforms of the constitution were made. Um, and what happened then was that, as we'll see, these constitutional changes allowed the Pondians to revert back to the original faith or to show, uh, or to come out of the closet, if you will. But there were a few issues with that. So, how did that happen? Yep. Theomorphos anthropos. So the period of great change in the Ottoman Empire became in the Tanzimat period, which was initiated by Sultan Abdul Majid. There he is. Uh, and his act, the Hati Sharif. Uh, this is in the year 1839, which was ratified and then 
uh, later expanded, and these reforms were a limited attempt to liberalize the empire, bring it up to date, up to speed with the rest of Europe. Um, with the uh, Hati Sharif, and that's the front page of it, there was a table of privileges published which uh, enshrined a right to life, respect for property, and also one's religion. And there was a push to allow for conscription for all members of the empire, but that was opposed by Muslims who didn't want the Christians bearing arms. And even though reform was passed, it was not applied, and the Christians still had to pay the jizya, the special tax for the privilege of being uh, Christians. Now, as a result of the ill feeling towards Christian, periodic, periodic acts of persecution took place against prominent Pondians between 1840 to 1842, and prominent citizens in certain areas often refused to abide by the reforms, and as a result, they were forcibly Islamized. In Gesaria, which is not in Pondos, but in Cappadocia, three entire villages were forced to change their creed during that period, and uh, part of that population chose crypto-Christianity as a viable option until things got better. This is the Hati Humayun of 1856. That's a constitutional reform, uh, which was issued after pressure from the European powers um, for equal rights to be granted to the Christians of the Ottoman Empire. And the Sultan emphatically said, that handsome guy we saw before, he said this, my heart makes no exception between the slaves of my empire. Rights and privileges will be equally shared between all of them with no distinction to all, with no exception. Sounds like something the tax office says in its ruling, slaves of the empire. So this caused the renaissance. That's the granting of the constitution, yeah? That's Turkey being liberated. And this is a Greek uh, gravura. And it says down there, Zito to syndagma, um, long live the constitution, which provides us all with equal rights, makes us feel really good about ourselves, yeah? Um, but as a result, Greek culture flourished in Asia Minor. Communities started organizing themselves, building schools, creating uh, self-help organizations, and uh, opening churches, because freedom to worship one's religion was granted. Um, the German clergyman, uh, Hermann Gensler, who was on the ground, commented about this period in the, in the Ottoman history. In Asia Minor, the Greeks are making unexpected progress. They grow in number quickly because there are a lot of children in every family. They move from place to place all the time. At first, a grocer will migrate. Then some families will move there too. A teacher comes, a church is erected, a priest is, are, is elected, not erected, and soon a new community is set up. They come into our country, they take our jobs, you know it. So the example of Amisos, which is known as Sabsunda, is most characteristic. Until 1860, Amisos was a small village of 4,000 inhabitants but within 15 years it became the biggest and busiest port with a population of 40,000 people, of which two-thirds were Greek. Important thing to know, we have this idea that the Greek population in Asia Minor was static, it was there from ancient times, and it showed no demographic change. That is not true. There was constant movement, constant migration, everything was always in flux. Just know this, yeah? Um, so yeah, all this is happening, these new and exciting things, and... Uh, these lovely crypto-Christians are coming out of the closet and even having theatres. I mean, look at that. That's a very bad and damaged theatre proof. Here are crypto-Christians coming out of the closet and having theatre and plays. Yeah? So, from 1856 until the official recognition of Cappadocia and the Pondos crypto-Christians by the authorities, which happened in 1911, so we're talking about a long process from 1956 to 1911 to get these people formal approval to be Christians. Um, there's several sources detailing the crypto-Christians, and the most characteristic being that of Mr. Panagiotis Sideropoulos, who was known as Pehlil. That's him. Uh, he unveiled himself to his boss, who was the Italian consul Fabri, and then on May the 14th, 1856, um, Sideropoulos was finally uh, recognized as a Christian by the Ottoman authorities because they wanted to do a favor to the Italians. And this was a great news for all the Greeks at the time, and they, who were hiding their faith. And on July the 15th, 1857, 1,590 crypto-Christians emerged in the uh, monastery of Theoskepastos in Trapezunda. And there's a picture of that. After a memorandum to the sublime port, the seat of the Ottoman authorities, uh, the ambassadors of the European powers and the ecumenical patriarch. A report of the British subconsul uh, Andrew Stevens in 1857 addressed to the British ambassador Stanford um, regarding the Kromni distant, uh, district in Pondos, and we'll be looking at that in depth a little bit later, stated that in 55 villages there were 9,000 Muslims 
17,000 crypto Christians and 28,000 Christian Greeks. Uh, Yervasios, the Bishop of Sevastia, made reference to the, Christ- the crypto Christians of Asia Minor by saying that after European interventions there in 1858, 25,000 of them came out and confessed their Christian creed. Now, what happens when all of these people come out and start saying we're Christians when all of, during all of this time the authorities believe that they were Muslims and had dealt with them as such? They get very scared. They've just opened up a roller coaster which they can't control. So, to hinder these changes, so that's the village, uh, one of the villages in uh, Kromni that we were talking about. To hinder these changes, the names of Christians on official lists was altered. So, instead of uh, recording them as Christians, which is what was, the Ottoman authorities were supposed to be doing according to the constitution, they created this new category called Tenesur Rum, those who claim that they are Rum, those who claim that they are Romans, those who claim that they are Christians. So this basically meant that this guy or girl who is saying that she is Christian is an apostate and could be liable for punishment. So children who were labelled in this way were not allowed to inherit their children's properties. So there were sanctions if you tried to do this, even though you're supposed you're afforded formal equality by law. So that's the constitutional legal boring part. That's the law of me getting that out of the way. So you know what the legal fabric is. Let's see how this panned out in practice. Orf is the region of Orphis in Bondos. Orphis means snake. Um, and I think that's apt, considering that, sh- that snakes shed their skin, and the people we're talking about also shed identities at will. Uh, the most important groups of Pondian Christ- the Christ- crypto-Christians at the time were the Hemshinli Armenians from the northeast coast, and they exist there today, and they speak Armenian, but they are Muslims. Yeah? They were forced to convert in the 17th century and the 18th century. These people were known in Armenian as Kes Kes, which means uh, half, half. If it's Erdogan, tell him I'm coming. Um, They spoke Armenian, as we said, and uh, they secretly celebrated uh, Christian events like the Transfiguration of Christ. They baptized their kids. And in 1856, some of the Armenians from the Karadere region uh, tried to revert to their old Christian faith. And they went to their local Aga, Such Mezoglu, who uh, told them to make a list of families that wanted to convert. So when three officials from uh, Istanbul came uh, to Surmena, which is where the seat of government was, that's that there, um, the matter was put before them. And at this point, Greek-speaking Muslim clerics from the region of Of, which is a neighboring region, intervened and said, if you allow the Hemshimli Armenians to become Christians again, well then guess what? That's going to open the roller coaster, which means that all of the Christians, all of the Muslims of the region of Of, who all speak Greek, will also want to become Christian, and then there will be no Muslims left in the region, and we're going to lose our jobs. So the officials became frightened, and they refused to register all of these populations as Christians. Okay? So we're looking at an attempt to stop the reforms that, uh, that had begun by the Ottomans. Turn now to the Kromlidis. Today we're going to talk about two groups, the Kromlidis and the Stavriotes, two separate distinct villages uh, in the region of between Trapezunda and Argyrupoli, Gyumushane in uh, Turkey, which was a place where there were a lot of silver mines. So, here, yeah, map of Pondos. They were a silver mining community of about 15 villages that had converted to Islam sometime in the middle of the 17th century, just like the Hemshinli Armenians we spoke about. Yorgos Andreadis, who's a chief Greek scholar, uh, on the crypto Christians, claims they were practicing Islam in public and Christianity in secret chapels hidden under the Konakia of richer Kromlidis, as you do. And there's some rich Kromlidis right there. Um, the Molas or clerics uh, were also their Christian priests. So by day, I'm a Muslim cleric. By night, I take off the turban and I wear my rasa and I'm a Christian priest. Yeah? That's what they were doing. And of course, the, the one thing they got in common is they both got the long beard, so it's okay. To outward appearances, they were Muslims and indistinguishable from all other Muslims. And Andreadis uh, paints a picture of them always being frightened of being outed. Yeah? 
But another scholar, Yorgos Tsevopoulos, criticizes this view lately. And what he says is that it would have been impossible for this community uh, to have remained secret for that long. It, it just doesn't work. And in these small, isolated communities where there's this great requirement to conform and for everyone to act in the same way, they would have been found out. It would have been known that these Muslims were NQR Muslims. Yeah? And he states this. No one was surprised when they came out publicly in 1857. And this observation was seconded by the British consul of Trapezunda, who, upon hearing that the Kromlides had come out of the closet, uh, remarked that the extreme indifference with which all Muslims talk of the intended change. From time immemorial, a suspicion has been attached to the inhabitants of the district that they are neither Muslims nor Christians. They knew, okay? And everyone knew that these were NQR Muslims. So that's a particular NQR Muslim Christian right there. Um, as you can see, you'd think he's a Muslim. He's not. He was one of the leading Christians of the time. So in some of the regions where the Kromlides lived, along with the open and out Christians, uh, they formed the vast majority of the population. In Sanda, uh, there were no Muslims whatsoever. And that's why a scholar who's looked into the Christo Christians, uh, Briar, has states, I don't understand the necessity for secret Christianity in an area which had no Muslims, and tentatively suggest that the crypto Christians of Santa may have once been Muslims, who, because of the overwhelming majority of Christians who surrounded them, were in the process of becoming Christians. So he sees crypto faiths as a two way conduit that conversion could take place from the stronger to the weaker side for various reasons. And that's something we need to consider. Some of these populations may have originally been Turkish or Muslim and then converted to Christianity because of proximity and because of isolation. We don't have enough facts to be able to address that question adequately, though. But it's important that we know that that argument is out there. Now, Greek historiography, the traditional Greek nationalistic historiography, portrays the Kromlidis as uh, coming out within the nationalist uh, discourse and narrative of neo-martyrdom where the religious impulse was paramount. They just had to get it out there. But there's also another theory. Yeah? The silver mines of Argyrupoli and Kromni had become economic uh, by 1857, and the state had uh, decided to close them down. This meant that the Kromlides, owing to their skills, uh, who were exempt from conscription as Muslims, would now have to undergo military conscription. So in order to avoid that service, they decided to declare themselves as Christians. Built some very nice churches of which the ruins you can see in the region today. So in the beginning, the entire affair was considered a joke by the Muslim authority, the Ottoman authorities, and the Turks said, the high street has turned to mud. The Kromlides have turned to Gaurs, infidels. Yeah, we know that word. However, things became serious when the Kromlides, who were quite wealthy and quite powerful in their region, sent a delegation to the Western embassies in Constantinople, highly embarrassing. And their petition shows they were very, very much in tune with the power politics of the time, and they knew all of the old 19th century buzzwords. Yeah? We depute these gentlemen by our firm and common decision to effect, by the way, they deem appropriate the disclosure of our up to the present, hidden from the Ottomans, Christian Orthodox religion. Hence, we please their excellencies, the ambassadors of the imperial powers of England, France, Austria, Russia, and Greece, to lead them into doing what is necessary for our religion and freedom. The Ottomans were not happy. Uh, they punished the Kromlides by creating, as we said earlier, that special subspecies uh, in their census of Tenesur Rum, those who claim that they are orthodox. And that way, they could punish these people without incurring the wrath of the Western powers because the Western powers uh, basically agitated for equal rights for Christians. But this is a different group. They're neither Christian or Muslim. They're in between. So the Kromlides, while hoping for the best, ended up with the worst. They were obliged to serve in the army and be recorded with both their Muslim and Christian names. And also the local Muslims forbade their erstwhile co-religionists to pay homage to their dead in Muslim, cere in, in Muslim uh, ceremonies and cemeteries. Another church there in Kromli. And there's a particularly nice looking Kromli who we'll talk about in a bit. So for, it took generations from the 1850s for these Kromlidas to try and take, shake off their Tenesurum uh, identity. And one way was through the manipulation of official documents. I love this. 
um, children born into Tanasurum families were ascribed to Christian families. So I'm a I'm a Kromni, I'm saying I'm a crypto Christian. I have a child, uh, it's born, and I say that's not my child, it's Yanni's child who's an out outed Christian. And that way the Christian population increased and, the, and, and my children have rights as Christians rather than Muslims. So that was one way of getting out of it. Um, Selim Deringil, who's a Turkish scholar who's looked at the archives, has also noted that there were places where the crypto-Christians actually bribed members of the local authorities to scratch out names, change names, and forge documents. A lot of that went on, and I find that fascinating um, from a viewpoint of archival history, if you will. So. On the 19th of February 1903, the Population Registry Bureau reported a strange case, and we'll look at this case. Um, two non-Muslims from Trapezunda, whose ancestors were from this, applied to have their change of address registered. One was called Baki, son of Osman Konstantin, son of Mustafa Yano, and the other, son of Baki, Yani Osman Konstantin. That's him. Yani Osman Konstantin. Yeah, Muslim and Christian name. So in the ensuring inquiry as to why these Christians also had Muslim names, it was revealed that they were Kromlidis, uh, who had converted back to Orthodoxy and were registering their children under Greek names. So the archives revealed that they still had to do military service. They couldn't get out, but by this time, their names only appeared in the Christian register. So they bred themselves out of the Muslim register. And the same document also mentions a similar, similar case involving people from Gerasunda, which is a little bit further on the coast. Um, these were Orthodox who converted, submitted to conscription for many years, and then wanted to return back to the Christian religion. And the Ottomans viewed them cynically, and they wrote this in the archives. It is clear that their derivation into apostasy is purely for the purpose of avoiding military service. This should not be allowed on any account, as such perfidious claims of Christianity will be materially and morally extremely injurious. Whenever such people are encountered, they will be immediately conscripted, a person cannot have two names, and where this is claimed, the Muslim name should be the only one appearing in identity papers. So, what was the legacy of the Kromlidis? It was basically to create an ambiguous category for themselves, neither Muslim nor Christian, but both, which could be used to their advantage depending on who they could bribe. Yeah? One of their churches? Stay here. When the mines of Kromni stopped working, uh, many miners sought work elsewhere in the empire, and one of them were the Stavriotes, and that's the village of Stavri with the ruins of the church. Now, interesting story. When I, in, in preparation for the lecture, and I was advertising on Facebook for the lecture, and I was putting up pictures like this, I put up this picture, and a gentleman from Greece contacted me and said, do you know the history of that church? And the history of this church is that when the Stavriotes, who left Kromni, came to Stavri, uh, settled in the region as Muslims, they, uh, the local Aga, the Muslim Aga, owned this land. And one of the Prukhondes, one of the leading members of the Stavriot community, ostensibly Muslim, went up to him, to the Aga, and said, you've got to sell me the land. Why? I had a dream that I have to build a church on this land. The Aga's looking at him, well, what are you talking about? No, 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 you've got to sell me this land, I'm going to build a church on this land. And the Aga told him to, you know, go from whence he came, and so he did, except that by some miracle, the, that night the Aga was asleep dreaming of what Ottomans dream about, and the Archangel Gabriel came to him and said to him, Hail, O the Aga, for you are going to donate your land to the Stavriotes. Thereupon shall be built a great church to the greater glory of God. And it was so, and they were filled with joy. And all about them said, this is brilliant. And that is how this church was built, according to legend. Which sort of puts the idea of the Turks knowing that certain populations were NQR, but given enough bribes and enough incentive, were able to negotiate their way around that in typical Greek fashion. Um, William Hasluck records the existence of the Stavriotes as crypto-Christians proper, belonging to the Greek rite and Greek by speech, who existed until recent years in the neighborhood of Trapezunda, and at his time, 20,000 had returned to the open profession of the faith. This is important. The Kromlidis were generally Turkish speaking. The Stavriotes, who came a little bit later in terms of their coming out, were Greek speaking. Uh, and they requested to be recognized as Christians officially 
uh, on the basis of the Constitution of 1876, so a little bit later. Unfortunately for them, though, their coming out was badly timed. And timing when you're coming out is everything, yeah? The relatively tolerant atmosphere of the late Tanzimat state, the original reforms, had ceded to the more strictly Muslim um, statism of Abdul Hamid. Abdul Hamid was the guy that created the Bulgarian massacres, started the Armenian genocide. He was a very, very nasty man. Um, the investigator who was appointed to look into the Stavriotes, Shakir Pasha, referred to them as people of two cults. Uh, they had presented a fake registry of births, deaths, and marriages, uh, greatly downplaying the number of births. Yeah? Stavriot tombstones, this so-called Muslim population buried their dead in uh, tombstones. That, that looks like a proskinitari, it's a church. We have the cross there. Um, and they're so-called Muslims, yeah? Shakir Pasha was not happy with this. He said that such an example can cause confusion in the minds of our simple Muslims, meaning that they may try and follow suit and decide that this looks better as a tombstone than what they had. Um, it's all about aesthetics at the end of the day. He recommended that the Metropolitan of Trapezunda should be reprimanded and that reliable imams should be sent to their villages and they should be severely enjoined to send their children to school and to give them Muslim names. So an interesting aspect of the suspicion surrounding the Stavriotes was that they were somehow linked to the Armenian revolts that took place uh, after the Armenian massacres of the 1890s when the Wali of Ankara reported that the leader of the Stavriotes, Kopchuoglu Ibrahim Efendi, so he's got a really Greek name, hasn't he? There he is. Um, should be removed from his post on the administrative council because of his connection to the Stavriotes and his uh, encouragement of the Armenians. Um, it was tried to be, they tried to enforce this. He was so powerful, he was so rich, he had bribed so many people that he remained where he was. So, in 1901, the Stavriotis presented a petition to the Ministry of the Interior and they wrote this. We've got the petition actually. There it is. That is the petition of the Stavriotis which is being pulled out of the Ottoman archives where they say, your servants are the Istavri people from Akdang Madeni. Our, that's the White Mountain. Uh, our fathers and forefathers were all Muslims. But somehow, to avoid military service, for some time hence, we have now become outwardly Muslim but inwardly orthodox. So we're orthodox on the inside. Why? To avoid military service. And they're open in it. They say it. It's, it's a really interesting document because it basically it explains what they did. These petitioners tried to get their leaders removed and said they would gladly register their births as Muslims. They seemed untroubled about reconciling uh, their open admission with being inwardly Christian, with their outwardly Christian, with their outwardly Muslim faith. And they also seem to think that being inwardly Christian was enough to get them out of military service. It's a really weird document and a really weird way to go about it if you want recognition for your faith. But what we can see is they're trying to hedge it both ways. We're kind of Christian, but don't hold against us. We're also Muslim. Just leave us alone. We don't want to pay tax. We don't want to serve in the army. That's what they're basically telling the Turks. And it didn't work. It's just pathetic. What we have is a transcript of the interview that Kobju Oglu Mustafa Effendi, the Greek, um, gave to the police when he was ultimately arrested for inciting the Stavriotes to become Christian. Uh, and the interrogator said this. Oh, I'm just happy that. What's your name? How old are you? Uh, what is your profession? Are you married? Um, what is your nationality? He says, I am Mustafa Effendi, son of Ibrahim. A shopkeeper, I am 52, married in the subject of the sublime Ottoman state. Do you have another name? Yes, my name is Nicolas. <laughs> when did you join the Stavri community? And that's another aspect of that church there. Um, the name Stavri is the name of the village. Stavri. I'm actually Rum, Viladi, Orthodox. My father, Ilya, came from Argyrupoli. I was born here. And you say that you are from the Greek Orthodox community. Your name is Nicola. Why do you also have a Muslim name? Didn't answer. What are the names of your children? Yanni, Spiro, Manoli. Yeah? Why do you say you're Orthodox? We've always been Orthodox. Everyone knows. We are registered in the church. At some date, we began to be conscripted, and that was when we came to be called by our Muslim names. 
We still give soldiers to the Ottoman Empire. For the last 58 years, when our children are born, they are given Christian names and our religious rites are carried out in church. This is important. It's a recent phenomenon. It's only for the past 58 years, according to Nicola slash Ibrahim Effendi. Yeah? Our births, deaths and marriages are recorded in the church register. The people are called Istavri and they number 150 families. They all have two names. And the prosecutor asks, at some date you became Muslims and took up Islamic ways and practices. You passed for Muslims for quite a long time and went to Muslim schools and madrasas, that's Quranic schools, where you learnt from Muslim books. And then you committed apostasy and joined the Orthodox community. All this is recorded in the official register, says the Ottoman prosecutor. And he says, we've always been Christian, but we go to Muslim schools to learn how to read and write. If we really became Muslims, and there are all these Muslims here, we would have taken brides from them and given brides to them. Ask anyone if such a thing ever came to pass. To whom are your daughters married? One is married to Lazar the jeweler, the other to Mikhail the blacksmith. Another is married to someone from our clan called Ismail, son of Salud, who has the Christian name Costa, son of Panayoti. It's schizophrenic. Yeah? The Kaimakam, the Otopotiritis uh, of the area, wrote that even though official instruction was to ignore their claim and to treat them as Muslims, he wrote this to the authorities. The Stavri were the most determined and united. They openly worshipped in the Christian manner despite the warnings. They have taken to openly using their Christian names and it is feared in time their Islamic identity will be lost. The authorities in the area were also investigating another phenomenon. This dude. The priest Kirilos, originally from Kerkira, who was living among the Stavriotes and encouraging them. The authorities protested when he would marry Stavriot girls to Christians. Uh, in particular, the daughters of Kobjuoglu Shakir and Kobjuoglu Ibrahim to Christians, and also marrying Muslim women to Christian men. And when questioned, the priest said, no, they're not Muslim women, they're Christians, they've been Christians for generations. Bugger off, I'm not even an Ottoman anyway, I'm a Greek subject, I claim protection from the Greek state, leave me alone. So, you have a situation where the traditional historiography tells us that Christians were second-class citizens, Christians were vulnerable, Christians were relatively powerless, and all of that is true. But in certain areas where Christians were powerful because they were isolated, like Stavri, they were going off and trying to convert Muslims to Christianity in the late 19th century and early 20th century. So, this Papas Kirillos... Uh, was involved in this story. On the 28th of April, 1902, the Mukhtar, or mayor of the village of Koyunlu, reported that a young man named Sofrajoglu Ömer had fallen in love with a Greek girl from Akhtag Maden. So, Stavri. The girl had converted to Islam, and the couple spent a few days with his family in Koyunlu, and then the husband went to work in the wife's Christian neighborhood, and then was drafted into the army. When he returned, that's the family. When he returned, um, the Mukhtar wrote, he and his wife had been tricked by Kirillus Effendi and had become apostates from Islam, becoming Christian. Behind every Muslim there lurks a Christian priest uh, waiting to trick you and make you a Christian. And the ensuring investigation also discovered that the priest Kirillus was collecting money for an ethniki eteria in order to teach everybody Greek. And he was also, surprise, surprise, considering the uh, context of modern-day politics, a Russian agent. Don't let Trump know. Omer's story is an interesting one because he was orphaned at a young age. Um, he was given as a servant to a Greek family, that of Efthim Aniki. And he worked for Efthim's uh, uncle, Nicola, for another four years. And it was while working for him that he fell in love with the daughter of Deli Yani, or Trelosso Yanis, a relative of Nicola. He fell in love with her. He took her to the family in Koyunlu, as we saw. They got married. Um, because he was told, if you want to marry this girl, she's got to convert to Islam. And he said, yeah, I'll arrange that. He got that to happen. But then they noticed that the girl's family did not pursue her, which was strange, because usually when Christian brides were taken from their families, the Christians would, in Pondos being rather feisty, would come and say, hey, what are you doing? Give us back our girls. And nor did the couple pray at the appointed prayer times, Muslim prayer times, 
even though it was Ramazan. So they realized that he had converted to Christianity and her conversion to Islam was a sham and they were really annoyed. And not only that, but he was urging his brothers to convert as well and to go and see Tom Papa Tom Girilo, who was a really nice man and would give him chocolates. On the 1st of May 1902, uh, the uh, mayor of that village went to the uh, Kaimakama of Ankara and he decided that Omar had to be found and taken somewhere secretly away from the Christians so that he can have the Christian bit uh, removed from him. Soon after, uh, one of the Ottoman officials in Yozgat appointed that Velil, son of Mola Osman, had been placed in the service of a Greek household in Maden, and that after seven or eight years living with the Christians, working for the Christians, he also had been converted. So it works both ways. Yeah? It's really interesting. It's not what we expect of this period. Because the Stavriotis were clever in the way they did it, in a way that the Kromlivis were not, they managed to avoid military service. And they also refused uh, to register their births, deaths and marriages in the Muslim registers. So it was difficult for the government to figure out who was liable for service, who was Christian, who was Muslim. They had them baffled for years. It was brilliant. Um, and the Stavriotis were recognised as Greeks and as Christians by the Ecumenical Patriarchate in Constantinople in 1902 when the Patriarch decided to write to the Ministry of Interior and saying, look, leave them alone, don't persecute them and stop pressuring them to go to Muslim schools and Muslim places of worship because they're not. Um, one of the main reasons why the Stavriotis were unassailable was because they were filthy, filthy, filthy rich and they used that filthy lucre to buy political influence. Do you know that scene in The Godfather where they're all around the table, all the heads of the five families, and uh, they're saying to uh, the great Don, you need to uh, share your politicians that you have in your pocket like so many nickels and dimes? Don Barzini is asking Don Corleone. Think Don Corleone, Stavriotes, all of them. All the politicians in their pockets or in their salvaria like so many nickels and dimes, they were unbelievable. Um, and the government report in 1902 wrote, these persons hold great fortunes and use this money to secretly work towards encouraging Muslims to become apostates. They work towards this aim all the time and have established such a diabolical tribe that one is shocked. In 1905, a converted, uh, concerted effort was made by the government to register them as Muslims and the priest Girilos was sent to jail. Um, there's a few more. However, in 1910, the Young Turk Revolution recognized both the Stavriotis and the Gromlivis as Christians because the Young Turks originally were all about equality between everyone. Everyone needs to be one with the empire. The empire is above everything. We're not interested in what you believe, uh, what language you speak. You need to be loyal to the Sultan and to the Ottoman Empire. Um, as the Young Turks extended conscription to everyone, regardless of religion. Claiming non-Muslim status was no longer advantageous. Uh, and therefore, you saw some of these outed Christians reverting back to Islam. It, it's a weird thing. Now, however, because at the time of the revolution and afterwards, the Kromlides and the Stavriotes were registered as Christians, they were forcibly deported during the population exchange. Yeah. Some of them there, and then more pictures of the church. Uh, in a fatal ironic twist, when after 1923, when it was made known to these Kurumbides that they had to leave and the Stavriotis, because you know what, you're Christians, and the treaty between Greece and Turkey states that all Christians, uh, in all Greeks in Turkey must leave, uh, in Asia Minor, Tulakistan, and all Muslims in Greece must go to Turkey. They said, oh, hang on, why? We're, we're not Christian. We're Muslim. To which the Agassad Kala, for the past 50 years, you've been telling us that you're Christian. What the hell is going on? They were not spared the exchange. They had to leave. Those, the Lavi, that survived the genocide because they were subject to genocide. Their pleas were ignored. Um, what do we understand from these strange cases that we've looked at today? Basically, that crypto-Christianity as a phenomenon was not as, not as secret as the 
traditional nationalistic Greek discourse would have us believe, and that despite um, the laws of the state and religion, there was fluidity in moving between these two ethnic groups. And these, ch these cases really challenge our perception of the stratified class and race relations in the Ottoman period, with the Greeks being monolithic on one side as Christians and the Turks being Muslims, and never the twain shall meet, always separate, never conjoined. We know that this is not the case. We've already seen how possibly part of the Pondic population may, although it is not certain, I stress, have been originally Turkish and Hellenized over a long period of time because their proximity with the Greeks. We also know that Turkish tribes were settled by the Byzantine emperors in Pondos before the fall of Constantinople. That is a fact. So there are all these issues that come to play, yeah? which are interesting. And also, we may look upon this and say, hang on, this is implausible. Why would they do that? Well, how can they maintain this charade for such a long time? Think about this. Think about how many people you know within our community that adopt Aussie names, I'm the first one, my name is Dean, and I call myself Costandinos. How many of us outwardly modify our behavior so as to appear more acceptable to the dominant culture? How many of us do not teach our children their language in order for them to get ahead within this world in which we live? And in that way, aren't we also sometimes a bit of crypto this, a bit of crypto that? And it's with that thought that I'll finish the, the presentation and invite you to ask questions or have a discussion about this really interesting phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, 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 no. Oh, Nico start. Sindonis. Yeah, so that's basically, how did the Turks get in there? What did they do? And why were they able, within a period of time, to supplant the other nations who were living there? Uh, just kick start off the, the question, Zine. Um, yeah. to, to, what, um, to what extent did some people go to, to disguise their crypto Christianity? For example, are the examples of the men sort of practicing Sunnet, uh, Islamic circumcision, to disguise their Christianity? Well, if you're a Muslim, yeah, when you get to the age of seven, you get circumcised. And that is one of the major tenets of the faith. So if you're practicing, if you're a practicing Muslim, you, can, you must get circumcised. So yes, at the same time that you're going to church, you're taking communion secretly like the Catholics during Elizabeth I's time, secretly in people's houses. So, and that's a fact. You are also being a Muslim at the same time. So yeah, you'd get circumcised if you're a man. And they were circumcised. That is true. Does, did everyone understand that? Do you need a translation or is that... Basically what Mr. Tsirkas is saying is that before the genocide of the Greeks began, uh, Prime Minister Venizelos at the time uh, told the Greeks of Pondos to unite with the Armenians. The bishop at the time, who I believe was Chrysanthos, uh, because he was a friend of the Turkish le uh, military leader in the, in the region, said, no, that's not a viable option. And after they finished with the Armenians, the, uh, they, they ended up with the Greeks. I'm not sure I agree with this version of history. Yeah, but That's great. Um, yeah. With names and everything and dates too. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm sure he did. I believe, you know what I believe that was? Mm. Because, you know, uh, when they finished the Armenians, the Greeks were very weak to do anything. You know that. 
and the world to exterminate all of them. The Okay. I'll tell you why I don't agree with respect. Because the Armenian genocide began in the 1890s and it continued in fits and starts right up until the 1920s, okay? Yeah, 1923, okay. Venizelos was not around then. This idea of the Pondo Armenian state was suggested by Wilson, the American president, at the Conference of Versailles at the end of the First World War. At that stage, at that stage, the western half of Pondos, which was under Turkish occupation, had been completely decimated. That, that is the section that copped most of the genocide. Okay, during the, second, during the First World War and a little bit after. The eastern part of Pondos was controlled, yes, by Chrysanthos, but as an agent for the Russians, because the Russians occupied that area at least from 1916 to 1917 till the time of the Russian Revolution. And after that army left, okay, after that army left, the Turks came in and began slaughtering and committing genocide. So, so... There was no suggestion of a Pondo Armenian state at that time. That happened in 1919, according to my understanding. But what I would say is that there were constant requests by Chrysanthos to Venizelos send us help, send us some type of assistance, save us. Venizelos said, Look, you're too far away. I can't. He sent a warship. That warship bombarded Sinopi and Samsunda. And all they did was destroy a couple of factories that were occupied by the Turks, and that was it, because that is all he could do. They were too far away, and the army was somewhere else. That's my opinion, but let's let other people ask questions. That's we can talk about it later. Yeah, that's later. Any other questions? Any other? Just, just speak up a little bit, please. No, it's the database. It's the database for everyone, and it's creating this social upheaval. And I can't understand why Erdogan would have done this. I'm in touch with people who live in southeastern Turkey who have discovered that their grandparents were Syrian, and they're starting to research what Assyrians are about. And some of them are looking into Christianity. Now, Turkey, even though it's supposed to be a secular state, is thoroughly religious because Turkish culture is imbued with the Islamic traditions. For this to happen, it's creating a revolution in thought. And it will challenge the foundations of the state. I can't figure out what he's doing. He's either mad or he wants to out these people so he can deal with them. Yeah. 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 Well, look, it, ma it makes perfect sense, and I know I, I remember a story that uh, Litsa Fanasiadu of Pondiakistia told me, where she was in a hairdresser's or somewhere similar, and a lady was getting her hair cut, and this small triangular object fell out of her uh, shirt, and that lady identified as Turkish, and Litsa said, "What is this? This is called filakto. Do you know what it is? I don't, but my grandmother gave it to me and told me to keep it safe. Yeah." Okay. Oh, I'm sure they could. I'm sure they could restrict access again. I'm sure they could restrict access again if they feel that they should. But it's out there now, and it's it's creating an upheaval. Before Kandakuzinos. Before Yeah. That's why you have to come to the 19th Where did the Turks come down from Turkestan? The Turks were roaming around the region from the 1040s because they were in Persia and they were migrating in droves from Central Asia to Persia because their 
tribes controlled Persia and then the sultans of Persia who were Turks because all these new people were coming in and they couldn't deal with them and they were challenging their authority, sent them off to our part. That's how it happened. But we'll talk about that next time. I don't want to give too much of the next lecture away. You need to come and see that, yeah? That's more interesting than this one. Andalagi, Andalagi, yeah, not Alagi, Pasok, Andrea, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hear what you say. The problem, the problem with our understanding of the Ottoman Empire is that there is no hard and fast rule that applies to the whole place because it was chaotic. This is not Germany where there were strict rules about how we're going to kill all the Jews. This happened on an ad hoc basis. And I'm aware in the research of some villages of Greeks and Armenians who said, no, we want to be Christian. We want to be Muslims. And they were accepted and they settled in the region, intermarried, and they're gone today. There are other people who did exactly the same thing, and the Turks did not accept it and deported them and killed them. It really was a schizophrenic ad hoc basis without any logic to it, depending on the whims of the people at the time, whether they were prepared to accept them, whether they were prepared not. And what usually happened was they wouldn't accept the men, but they'd take the girls. And that is not a stereotype, and it's not an exaggeration, because that happened very recently, and it's still happening today in Iraq, Egypt, and all throughout the Middle East, where Christian girls are fair game, they abduct them from their families, they forcibly marry them to Muslims, and then they're gone. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. Um, I was interested to hear about the constitution changes yeah. and the consequences of it. Um, was that a, a risk if not sought out you to take the pressure to do that? They were forced to do it because remember, um, there was. Greece became independent, Serbia was creating problems, Bulgaria, at least the northern part of Bulgaria became autonomous, the southern part hadn't yet, Anatoly Piromilia. Uh, there were the Russians pressuring them, and there were treaties, Kuchukai, Nanjir, and other treaties about uh, how to treat Christians. And also, the Ottoman Empire is considering, well, look, um, we've got this outmoded army, we've got all these outmoded traditions, why is the West beating us when we are so superior, which they believe they were? right up until then. We've got to do something about it. So let's adopt a more modernized, Western-based constitution, keep them happy, maybe magically will become more powerful as a result as well. To keep, to keep them happy, the, external the external pressure from the, the external pressure from the Christians, the, it, 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 the Christian powers, it really never permeated down to the, the bottom strata of society. They remained unchanged by this. And because it's a Middle Eastern document, it's subject to change, it's subject to uh, the whim of the people who enforce it. It was not really enforced. Yeah? It was just, um, what do you call it? Just like all of the constitutions of the communist countries in the Soviet bloc were democratic. Savas. Many ethnic Greeks who became Muslim were forced to... Well, well, the thing is this, and this is the interesting thing about it. So-called Muslims who became baptised and converted, a lot of them remained in Greece. Well, it's the opposite phenomenon. Not many people chose to do it. They chose to leave. So they were quite entrenched. Regardless of their origins, a lot of them were quite entrenched within that Muslim identity. Because remember, in the Middle East, of which Greece is a part, whether we like it or not, religion, right up until recently, formed the core of a person's identity. People define themselves by their religion rather than their ethnicity. The definition of someone by their ethnicity is a relatively new thing in the Greek consciousness, which is why you've got problems in Macedonia. Yeah? Because in that region, it was not clear who was what, because up until nationalism, people just defined themselves as Christian. However, let me... I'll just finish and you can make a point. There were Muslims who remained behind and converted to Christianity. I know this in Ipiros, and you could tell who they were because at least for one generation, the other families in the region, just like in Pondos, wouldn't mate with them or give their daughters or sons to them because they were NQR Christians. Yeah? For at least one generation, they wouldn't eat pork. They would do funny things like do this. 
after they had eaten their meal, which is an Islamic prayer. And then that was slowly bred out. We're talking about 1920s, yeah? So Tuandistrof will happen with the Muslims in Greece somewhere. Yeah. Maybe let someone else ask a question and we'll go back. That's Hamidiyya. That's a bit different. That's Hamidiyya. Okay. Does uh, the same system exist now in Turkey with uh, crypto Christians and... Uh, a lot of... Are, yeah, yeah. They are in uh, 2011, I think, in, uh, in Constantinople. And uh, we had a guy who did this, and uh, his name was John, about mm. 20 years old. And he said he had to convert to Muslim name during the day all the time, but uh, well, well, he was, uh, even Psalmist in uh, uh, he uh, joined in the Muslim Union. Mm -hmm. Egyre Muslimano. Egyre uh, Muslimano, Salah. He said this thing. Well, he had to serve to the Turkish army, but he was not allowed to get a job as a public servant. So that's why he was studying uh, something in uh, commerce. Well, I'll tell you this. Despite the fact that Turkey is a so-called secular state. There is a prejudice to, against people of other religions, okay? I don't believe that there are many crypto-Christians in Pondos now. I'll tell you why. First of all, συντριπτική μάζα αυτών των ανθρώπων έφυγε. Ή σκοτώθηκαν ή φύγανε. Έτσι. Από αυτούς που μείνανε, οι περισσότεροι, οι περισσότερες ήταν οι γυναίκες. Έτσι. Που παντρεύτηκαν μουσουλμάνους, απομονωμένες από το παρελθόν και από την παράδοση, δεν μπόρεσαν λόγω του φανατισμού του καιρού εκείνου, επειδή θεωρούσαν τους Έλληνες θανάσιμους εχθρούς, έτσι, να μεταφέρουν την παράδοση αυτή, την κρυπτοχριστιανική, γιατί ήταν μια παράδοση μιας υποκουλτούρας Ελλήνων, έτσι. Οπότε αυτό αποκόπηκε τελείως. Δεν υπήρξε συνέχεια. What you do get, though, is people who are discovering their roots or remember their roots, looking into the Christian religion, looking into the way their ancestors lived and maybe possibly identifying through the internet, through books, with that. But that's different. That's like rediscovering something from the beginning. It is not a continuous tradition. I would argue that there is not many of them. Are there members of the Christian and Jewish minorities converting to Islam in Turkey today? Yes, there is. Yes, there are many of them. Either because there are not many of them left, and this happens a lot with the Jewish community in uh, Zmirni. There are not many Jews left. The ones that remain behind either migrate to Israel or they fall in love with Turkish girls because they grow up with them and then they convert because that's the only viable option. It happens. It is not easy to be a religious minority in Turkey. Okay. It's been on a question that I just uh, think just a few decades ago called Pontus Kutulubu. Yeah, yeah. That was probably part of the Absolutely. And then we have that uh, famous uh, case of that uh, guy whose name I can never remember, Vasily, uh, who claims that he's a Pondian and has converted to Christianity and has been uh, actually incarcerated for his beliefs, which I think is very mature. So you see that these things annoy and uh, challenge the Turkish authorities in their own narrative. they were Christians, whether they identified as Greeks, we don't know, because that identity did not exist in Byzantium. Uh, and it was before Byzantium. Oh, it wasn't before Byzantium. It was be before the fall of Byzantium. Before, yeah. Sorry, before the fall of Byzantium. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, were they, were they, did, were, were, was his mother a Greek-speaking lady who was Christian? Yes, she was. Yeah? yeah. There were heaps and heaps and heaps of prominent Ottoman sultans, generals, uh, governors who were Greek or of Greek origin right up until the 1900s. And one of them was the mayor of Cairo in the 191910, who was from the catastrophe of Smyrna. Not the catastrophe of Smyrna, the catastrophe of Hiu. And he was particularly long-lived and he lived in Cairo right up until 1910. Another was the person who founded Cairo. The person who founded Cairo was a, the, the, the modern city of Cairo, Fustat, was a Greek slave who was stolen from his uh, family, Islamized, and 
did that. So, yeah, no, we're everywhere. We, there are, I think, more prominent Greeks who were Muslims and made lasting contributions to the Ottoman Empire than Greeks who remained Christian and whatever they did. But we won't say it, talk about that again. Maybe some other time. No, I don't. I don't think so. No, I don't. I don't believe it. If there are, there'd be very few. And I think after so many generations after the catastrophe, and because of the pressure in in the region to conform, it would be very difficult for that to survive as an identifiable mass of people. Why? Back in those days, in 1923, we're talking about small, isolated villages, no communication, very little schooling people having not much contact with anybody else. Ever since 1923, with electrification, with internet, with compulsory schools, with indoctrination, with uh, compulsory military service that takes people from their region and sends them to other parts of Turkey, television and Turkish soaps, which I'm addicted to, I love them, it is, wouldn't be, wouldn't be easy to keep that tradition. Look at us, we've abandoned our, our religious tradition and our language within two generations. It's not hard, and, and, and we're free. Because yeah. they're living in their local area. Sorry, yep. Διότι ο Ερντογάν δίνει με το ένα χέρι και παίρνει με το άλλο, διότι ο Ερντογάν είναι διπλωμάτης και έξυπνος. Και ξέρει ότι ο Έλληνας που βλέπει τη χειρονομία αυτή δεν θα καταλάβει τι κρύβεται πίσω από αυτήν, διότι ο Έλληνας είναι εφήμερος και καθόλου έξυπνος. Κατά τη γνώμη μου, όσον αφορά την εξωτερική πολιτική της Τουρκίας. Erdogan said this thing uh, in the media because he was asked, is it true that your grandmother was Georgian or that she was Armenian? He didn't say anything about Greek. And he said, a lot of people are accusing me of this terrible thing, this unspeakable, unspeakable crime of having a Georgian or pff, Armenian grandmother. I'm 100% Turkish, I assure you. So there you go. Not true. We can have. Okay. Um, then we'll be here until midnight to answer. Sort of. Um, <laughs> 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 give the floor to Minister, please. The floor to Minister. I'm not saying. I'm not saying too much. The only thing I want to say is. Um, <laughs> 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 And a very inquisitive lot too. Um, uh, on behalf of the uh, the Greek Genocide Commemoration Committee, I want to thank you for all your effort, your, your research, thank you, your uh, your presentations are always uh, a joy to, to listen to. And I want to mention um, I would also like to thank Wendekiestia and the Greek community of uh, Melbourne, Victoria, for uh, their efforts as well. Um, the one thing we, we, that we have to do better and. We started that today is uh, one, go live with uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. these presentations, and the second thing is to start creating an archive of these uh, presentations as well so it can be accessible uh, by others, uh, not, not just from, uh, of course, from Melbourne, but there you were know, a few questions I got from people from overseas, like the US as well, about um, getting uh, a look at uh, what you basically had to say. So that's all going up. Uh, we'll do another decent edit as well. Yeah, uh, do a decent edit. <laughs> Get rid of the edit. Yeah, airbrush, airbrush. Not a problem. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much, uh, Dean. And on behalf of everybody here, uh, please enjoy it. <laughs> oh, sorry, what is it? Oh, I will enjoy it. Please support all of the events which the, the committee organising the Bondian Genocide Commemoration are uh, holding here in Melbourne, 19th of uh, this 18th month. 18th of May. 18th of May, the 19th of May, the, the wreath laying ceremony. There's another lecture on Sunday. Absolutely, um, yeah. So, uh, ask this gentleman, he'll tell you, very important that we all get involved because the Pondian genocide is not just something that happened to a group of people that are unrelated to us. If it happened to one Greek, it happened to all of us. We need to understand it and we need to be active about it, please. So thank you very much. Absolutely. <laughs>
costume. I get a costume. Yeah, well, I got bored. You need glasses, right? No music. The more of a must take it. Every year we take this photo. <laughs> <laughs>